Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Barard. I'm your host, Michelle Barard, founder and CEO of Michelle A. Barard LLC and Urban Book Editor. And I'm very happy to share this hour with you, where we examine all those places where spirit meets life and the joys and challenges that may bring. Now, I hope you all have been doing well and taking care of yourselves. For our part, we've had a couple of adventures this summer, including my kids being fairly certain they had a run in with a zombie cicada tonight. So we truly do live in interesting times. Now, you guys know I do like to start by thanking Ms. Beverly Black and Tribe Family Channel for helping me create this space for us. Tribe Family Channel is home to an assortment of thought-provoking shows that explore life, spirit, business, and culture, including The Woman at the Well, hosted by Ms. Beverly Black herself. Somewhere in the Middle was born on Tribe Family Channel, and though we have grown onto our own platform, we are ever grateful and loyal to our roots. To paraphrase an African proverb, we are here only because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. I want to say thank you to my guest on the August 7th show, author, coach, and spiritual photographer, Kaolin Kay. You can connect with Kaolin on social media and at her website. If you missed that show, make sure you listen to the replay. You can find our complete show archives, including the August 7th show, at the Somewhere in the Middle Podcast.com. I also want to shout out Bruce George of the Geniuses Common Movement, which encourages all of us to embrace our inner genius and share it with the world. This is a really important message. You guys know how I feel about that. And we really need to share this with the youth. But this message is not just for the youth. Sometimes we adults need to be reminded that the world needs our genius. Learn more about the Geniuses Common Movement at www.geniusescommon.com. Now, I had such a great interview with this guest. I'm really excited to introduce him. Nicholas Mays started writing at the age of 12. And despite becoming distracted from writing early in life, he later went all in pursuing a master's degree in creative writing. Mays is the author of the popular book series, White Collar Woman. The series focuses on a successful young woman named Marla Evans and her adventures as she grows in her career and finds love. So I'd like to welcome Nicholas Mays to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Berard. Nicholas, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be on the show. Well, you know, I have um, a fascination with writers, with authors. I really like knowing about you guys. And I like to start my interviews with two questions because I really think that kind of gets into the meat of things pretty quickly. So okay. are you ready? Yes, definitely. Okay, so Nicholas Mays, who are you and how did you become who you are today? <laughs> well, I'm a, a local author based out of Flint, Michigan. Um, as far as how did I get to where I am, I would say, I don't, I don't know if it's, I could say I was born with writing, but I know I discovered my writing I guess you say gift at the age around 12 or 13. I always had a creative mind. So, you know, I always had little ideas here and there. And then one day around that age of 12 or 13, I thought, you know, maybe I could write a horror story. I don't know what made me choose horror. I guess, you know, around that time, this was in the, the early nineties. So maybe that was the big thing when, you know, Jason, Freddy Krueger, all that was out. So, mm -hmm. I said, you know, maybe I could write my own horror story. And then that's what, next thing I know, I wrote out a story. And then I shared it with my parents. And, you know, I didn't really tap back into it until my mid-20s. But that that was definitely my where it all began. I was around the age of 12, 13. Wow. Okay. So what kept you from writing until your 20s? <laughs> I always tell people I want... I don't want to make my mother look bad, but when I wrote my horror story, you know, the, the first person I went to was my, I believe it was my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, I let him read the story first and he wasn't really excited about it, but he did compliment and say, you know, good job. But when I took it to my mother, she's, I, I one, that's why I say one of the things I like about her, she's always been my, my critic that I, I love to hear from. Cause if she don't like something, she lets you know, you know, if, if I get her to, say she likes something that's a huge thing for me so mm -hmm. when she read the horror story she got very upset i still remember the scene of everything she was washing dishes 
And when she found out I had wrote a horror story, she got mad and said, my kids shouldn't be writing stuff like this. And I think, I don't know if that was that turn off switch, but at that moment, I didn't write anything else. <laughs> so I got wow. Yeah. So her, her objection was to the horror? Was that, yeah, was it to the genre? Uh, yeah, because yeah, my mother, she ain't big on scary movies and she, she like <laughs> love stories. <laughs> you know, she's, she's a fan of the Hallmark channel. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's her type of genre. So when she seen that her young son was writing stories about killing and horror, I guess that was a, <laughs> a, a huge turnoff for her at that moment. Yeah, I could see that being concerning or upsetting to some extent. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's funny that that makes me wonder then your current style of writing, you don't write horror, do you? No, nope, not at all. That, that's why I believe it was just at that age, you know, that's around that age. I think that's what we into, you know, we into, like I say, watching the Jason movies, the Jaws and, you know, all those type of movies. So I believe that's where the idea came from. But it wasn't, you know, because I was into video games, a whole lot of different stuff. So it wasn't, I wasn't a huge fan of horror, but I guess that's just the idea that popped up at that moment. That's interesting. And you've never <laughs> tried your hand again. No, nope, not in that, that type of genre, not in horror. That is fascinating to me because <laughs> it seems like that would be, you know, I always believe that in some ways we are who we are most meant to be when we're children. Right. You know, so what if you were supposed to be, you know, writing, writing horror? Have you ever <laughs> right. wondered? Being there with uh, Stephen King, I, I don't know. Yeah. It could have been, <laughs> been possible, but I, don't, I think it was just more about the creative side, you know, believing I could because I even around that age, like I say, I was big in video games. So mm -hmm. I also tried to create my own video game magazine. So I, <laughs> I was wow. just in the, the creative side of creating things, not just a specific area. So you're a gamer as well. You were a gamer. Are you still a gamer? Uh, yeah, I were a gamer. I, I, it's been years since I picked up a remote uh, video, ga video game controller because it's I don't know what caused the change. I guess real life's taking on jobs, going to school. Mm -hmm. Maybe that turned me away from it. But yeah, I, I was the young kid that was up to two or three in the morning playing video games, definitely. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. So, well, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that sparking creativity in a different way, though. Definitely. What yeah. got you into your current genre? Tell us about the books that you write now. Uh, right now, I've been focusing on my uh, fiction series, which is White Collar Woman. I actually released the latest one. This is book number six in the series. And I, I released that on July 4th. Okay. And, and the reason I got to that, that, that actually was the first book I came out with in my mid-20s. And at that time, I was working a security job. And, you know, you got different security jobs. Sometimes you on your feet all day patrolling. Sometimes you may be in a car, and then sometimes you're just sitting at a booth, you know, mm -hmm. watching people come in. And mm -hmm. that was one of those times I was at the person that was at the booth and just sitting there. So you're sitting for eight hours. And like I said, with my imagination, things start coming up as I'm sitting there. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I could write this story that I'm thinking about. And, you know, I started putting it down on paper. I, I probably did about two or three chapters. And then I, I shared it with my family and friends, my coworkers, and I, I wanted to get their input of what they thought about it. One of the reasons I chose this type of genre, I wanted to center around a young, successful woman. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I was leaning towards the genre where mo mainly women would read. And I wanted a story that showed a, a woman in a different light, where it wasn't in a negative well, you know, it is a drama. You got, she deals with drama, but at the same time, she was a successful woman. You know, I want to show her mm -hmm. in the, on the bright side. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's where I leaned towards when I did my first book. And that was White Collar Woman, the original book. And you said that you passed it to friends and family for feedback. What kind of feedback did you get? Oh, it, it was amazing. Everybody was excited. And they told me to finish the book. You know, they, they was real excited into it. And that's what pushed me because, you know, I was just taking a chance to see what I would get from it. And after I got all that huge response and all the positive comments, and I just went from there and made a whole an entire story and 
finished the manuscript, got it proofread, proofread and it was on from there. So tell me about your journey then at becoming an author, because you published one book. Mm -hmm. um, how did that work out for you? Did you find it easy to sell your book? Did you, what, what were some of the challenges that you ran into? The, the, the biggest challenge was being unknown, mm -hmm. you know, because you, your family and friends know you, but trying to go outside that, that circle of family and friends was a huge challenge as far as, you know, the marketing, promoting, and because like they said, it's, it's millions of people that write books and it's often that you don't hear about everybody. You know, mm -hmm. it's a certain group of people that you know about in specific genres. So I will say that's the biggest challenge was just being an unknown author, entering a whole new realm where it, you got billions of readers, but, you know, finding a way to reach out to them and let them know that you have a book. So that was the, the biggest challenge. Other than that, I, I think I enjoyed the rest of the process because I, I enjoyed the feedback, interacting with people. You know, I would do a lot of different book shows and I, I visit a few book clubs where they had like the little outdoor event where I could sit with them and get their, their feedback on my book. So I enjoyed that part. It was just to get my name out there was the, the biggest challenge. So what kinds of things did you do to overcome that challenge? Uh, a lot of marketing. Uh, I think back then social media was just getting its spark. You know, it was just, mm -hmm. it, it had grown a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't as big as it is now. Mm -hmm. So I would, I really didn't understand the marketing part on that side of marketing as far as in the social media. So I would reach out to, you know, radio stations and back when people were still active and listening to the radio and trying to figure out how to get in touch with book clubs. And it, so it was, that was a challenge as well because I didn't know, the, the first, I didn't know how to begin with marketing and reaching other people. So that was definitely another challenge. So you reach out. So it sounds like you were doing all your legwork yourself. You didn't. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So you were reaching out to radio stations. You were reaching out to book clubs. And what kinds of things were you doing? Were you like just calling and saying, hey, I've got this book. I want to come. Promote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, and that was a little awkward too because, like I say, you you unknown. So the people they they receive an email or something in the mail, and they don't know who you are. So some people might have looked at it and threw it to the side. Like I don't know, you know, is this junk mail or what? What is this? And they throw it to the side. So that was that was another challenge because you you're going into it blind, you know, right. trying to reach people. So yeah, and like you said, I was doing all the leg work. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a new author. I didn't have a, a strong financial backing. Everything was out of pocket. So I only went as far as I could go along with, you know, working my job and still having to pay my bills and, you know, all the other expenses that come along. Well, related to that, how did you go about publishing the first time? The first time I, I, get, I got a little small publishing deal with a, um, I don't know what the name is for him, but it was like a little small publishing company. It wasn't a, a big name, you know, cause mm -hmm. I originally I tried to reach out to the big name publishing companies. I was trying to find any way I could to get in contact with them. I would send out, you know, the very first thing was sending out manuscripts. Right. Cause I, I was just in the beginning stage. So I, the book wasn't published and I was hoping to get that big name, but like everybody say, even the big name authors like Stephen King, who we was talking about, you know, all the rejections that you get, you just constantly mm -hmm. get rejections. So yeah, I was trying to reach anybody I could. And then I had to settle for a small publishing company, which normally they don't have a strong backing to get you out there like the big names, but mm -hmm. just to have the, the publishing behind me was a huge thing for me. When I finally got that response and they accepted me to publish my book and they actually designed the, the cover for me for that first book. Okay. And you know, the, just to have that backing was a huge thing for me because I, I did a huge uh, book release party in my, my hometown. I just, I was very happy at that moment. That was a big experience for me. That's awesome. So, yeah. but the small press, they published you, they helped you with designing the cover. Yeah. And what about helping with the marketing at that point? I'm not sure how much they did on their end of marketing. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I believe I believe they did, but they didn't really let me know like how many people they reached or but they definitely they should have I believe did some sort of uh, mark me. Mm -hmm. But as far as on my end, I was the, the one doing all the lead work. And then did you stick with that company for your next book? Or what was what did you decide after that? No, actually, after I did that one, and I seen the end result, although I enjoyed everything, and it was, a, you know, I, I reached some people. And I, for overall, it was a good turnout just to be able to have a book out there and people can access it and read it. But as far as getting a, developing a name behind it, I didn't, you know, achieve that with that small press, like you said, small press publishing company. So after that, I, I viewed everything and I said, this is something I can do myself, you know, because I was doing research at the same mm -hmm. time, you know, Googling, finding mm -hmm. out about being a self-publisher. So after seeing that and I was like, why not do it myself? Because normally when you, you know, get a deal with a small press, they get a portion of your sales. And I was thinking, you know, the, for them to get a portion of my sales and why not just do it myself where I get the, all the profits. So after that last, after the first release and when I got prepared for my next book, I went, I moved over into self-publishing. And so what was that experience like? Self-publishing, I enjoyed it because you, you got full control. Although mm -hmm. you don't have the... I would say the one thing I miss about being with a small press is probably just the having the name behind you, where it's not just your name or being labeled a small a self publisher. You actually have a publishing company behind you. Other than that, I enjoy I, I enjoy to this day being a self publisher. I, I enjoy that part of it because you got full control. Nobody's going to look over your book and say, well, we don't like this part. You need to edit this or take this out. Mm -hmm. It's all in what I want to put out. And I think that's what every author is look, looks for. They want to have, you know, a pure product of who they are. They don't want to have it modified, you know, right. from someone else. Well, and that's one of the things that I talk with authors about when they come to me for editing is that, you know, really thinking through that process, because these days, unless you're a James Patterson or a Steven Spielberg, you're not having these, even the big companies promoting your book right. the way that Definitely. they used to back in the 60s, 70s, 80s even. Right. It's, it's a whole new world and, and successful authors are doing all the legwork themselves. <laughs> and <laughs> right. a, a lot of them are moving to self-publishing themselves for that reason. Yeah, because like you say, the big names, they're, they're not really taking chances like they once were. You know, mm -hmm. once they once they get a, a few big name or however many big name authors under them, they're they're good. And you know, they they may take a chance here and there if you manage to generate some publicity on your own. But other than that, you know, they're not really taking chances like they once were. So you really just go out and self publish for yourself. Now, when you do your self publishing, um, do you what do you uh, get people to help you with? What parts of the process do you get other companies or other people to help you with? Um, definitely with the editing, you know, and that's, that's one thing I learned with all my books is like, you know, in the beginning, you want to do every part of your book. You know, you believe you can design the book cover. You can do everything. You can edit your own work, you know, cause you're thinking this is my work. I, I'm able to edit it. But one thing I learned, you probably read your book six or seven times to still find an error mm -hmm. you know so definitely hiring a someone to edit my book and then definitely with the book cover get somebody to design it because you know you always want a nice professional job you know it's not hard to get on there and get on the the paint uh program on your computer <laughs> or <laughs> you know get a picture and make a few modifications but you always want that quality work so it looks attractive, you know, to the reader as well. Well, and then what about the process itself after? So you you plan out your book or are you a panster or a planner? How do you write your book? So we, I never heard the panster part. <laughs> when you say panster. Uh, so those are terms that they use in NaNoWriMo and they talk okay. about Panthers versus planners. Planners, of course, are the ones who like to do an outline and plan out their chapters and all that. And panthers are the ones who just kind of start writing. They fly yeah, by the definitely. seat of their pants. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a pastor. I would say that. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I, I like to when it comes to writing, I like to go with the flow. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I want my story to be as real as I can get it, you know, because if you plan it out to me, this is just in my opinion, when you plan it out, then you're creating a world in, in, a, in advance versus if you was living in the real world, things might come about that you wasn't expecting. So, you know, when I write, I, I do have a little bit to go with, but as I'm writing, you get ideas just like in real life. You know, you, you come across something, you might walk into a store and see somebody you hadn't seen in 15 years. And mm -hmm. then that, that changes everything in your life for that day. And right. that's the same with writing a story. You know, I wanted, I might write about a person about to meet someone at a grocery store, but then an idea comes to me, well, what if they was on their way to the grocery store and this and this happened before they got there? And then that's how my, I go, my flow of writing. So I'm definitely a, a pastor. Well, but you just said the thing that I think most fiction writers say is what if that's that seems to be the key question that fiction writers are always asking well what if this happened or what if that right. happened and yeah. do, do you find yourself in just real life maybe you're at a coffee house and you're looking at people and you're kind of seeing their interaction and going hmm what if yeah Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that part too. <laughs> because I, I, I definitely, I think with each book, and that's what I tell a lot of people, like, I think each character in whatever book I write has a little bit of people I know or of experience. It doesn't, it's not one whole person, but like I can take something they might have experienced and take a little bit of that and create a story out of it. So it's, it's not, there's no particular person within the book but just my experiences with people help me generate characters and storylines throughout the book. So why was it so important to you that your character, your main character was a successful black woman? Uh, I, because I, in my opinion, I believe uh, there's a lot of fiction stories where a lot of the black characters are shown in a negative light or they like you get a lot of street literature you know and they they might be hustlers or you know it's they dealing with some challenges with and like i say in my series they definitely deal with challenges but i wanted to wanted it to be at a professional level mm -hmm. you know i wanted i wanted the reader to see like because normally when you read you put yourself in that story you know as you're reading it you you viewing through the eyes of the character so why not view through the eyes of a professional character? You know, they, they can have real life challenges, but be professional at the same time. You know, you get the, the best of both worlds as you read the story. Got it. And why a female character? I mean, just a lot of guys, you know, kind right. of resonate. I mean, there's, there are so many famous uh, authors, you know, male authors who write very successfully female characters, but I'm wondering what drew you to a female character in particular. I believe, I always think back to when I first started the story. And like I say, I was sitting at my uh, security booth and uh, I was thinking, I said, I want to reach as many people as I can with my story. And I thought, I said, well, majority of readers, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but I, I always believe that majority of book readers are women. So I wouldn't want to give a story about a man. And I mean, and, and that could be attractive to the women readers, but I wanted a story that the woman reader could relate to. And at the same time, I knew it would be a challenge. So I had to think about all the people that's in my life, my family, cousins, sisters. I was raised with two sisters, my mother, aunties, grandmothers, you know, everybody. I had to pull from them, you know, because I knew it would be a challenge being a man. But I also wanted to have that book for the the women uh, readers and the as far as when it comes to books. Wow. Well, and so you're on your sixth book. You just released your sixth book. Yes. And with the same character. Yes, the same main character. Yeah. And where does she go from here? I mean, this is six books in. I mean, there, <laughs> it's certainly possible to do. You know, there there are authors who do twenty, thirty books. Um, right. 
with the same character? Are you seeing yourself branching out into another genre or switching series, you know, creating something new? Uh, definitely. I, I'm leaning towards doing a self-help book. You know, I've, I've been on both sides because actually when I finished my first book, White Collar Woman, I went off into nonfiction and I did a finance book. And the reason that came about because I always dealt with finance. I actually had a, a well, I do have a bachelor's degree in uh, accounting. And that I felt that was where I was led to do was do a book on finance. And so now that I've done book six, uh, there may be a possibility, you know, because I actually wasn't sure if there would be a number six in the White Collar Woman series. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the idea came and next thing I know, the creative juices started flowing and we, now we're here. You know, we got the book number six. Uh, but right now, definitely a self-help book is in the making. And if something were to come along after that, it's, it's possible. I, I wouldn't doubt it if it does, but I don't know. I, I think one thing I like about each book in the series is that it has its own story. Like you could, if you were to read six, you could enjoy it without having to read the previous. Now you will get a better understanding if you read the previous books, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it has its own story with the same characters or majority of the characters, but at the same time, you could read it as its own and still enjoy it. So it's it's possible that I would get to another one, but I, I, that's still up in the air. So I have to see. Well, what kind of self-help do you think that people need right now? Mm, I would say better understanding of self, of, of who they are. And that's that's one of the things I've been researching and doing a lot of understanding for myself because it's it, it's amazing because it's been like a a spiritual spiritual journey because in, in in actuality i was writing two books at the same time I, I started off with white collar woman six and then i got the idea for the self-help book because i was starting to learn more about myself and who we are as pe people our spiritual being mm -hmm. and I, I thought to myself there's so many people that don't know this you know is you don't have a lot of you do have motivational speakers but I don't believe they go deep enough where they, they tell you about yourself. They motivate you and let you know you can achieve what you want in life. But I think you can take it a step further and explain to them why you can achieve whatever you want in life. You know, explain to them who they actually are and the power they possess, you know, while they're living here on this earth. So that was a motivation to start writing that book at the same time. So I did majority of it while I was writing White Collar Woman 6, and I'm going to work to finish that one and hopefully have that one ready as soon as possible. Wow. Well, if you had, let's say, three pieces of advice for someone who wanted to write and publish a book, what would those three pieces of advice be? Uh, number one would be don't doubt yourself. You know, because it's definitely going to be a challenge. You know, it's, I, I, I really only started writing because I was, uh, my imagination was running. I didn't sit back and say, I think it's time for me to become an author. I, I was just, it was just my imagination at that moment. And then I went with the flow. And after the positive responses, I, I knew I could do it. And I went from there. But if a person set out to be an author, it's just like, a person setting out to open a, a restaurant or, you know, any type of new project you want to get into, there's definitely going to be self-doubt. So it's definitely the, you got to look past that. That would be the number one. Uh, number two would be uh, being able to manage your writing. You know, when you start out, that's one of the things I learned when I started writing books is like, if you got an idea of what you want to put on paper, I would recommend not put everything at one time. You know, every, if whatever's going through your mind right now, leave a little bit for the next day because that's one of the things we always face as, as authors is writer's block. You know, you hear a lot about that, a person having writer's block, and then the next thing you know, they didn't stop writing for two to three months because they don't know what else to put on the, on the paper. And one of the things I learned is that when your creative juices are flowing, when you get towards the end of what you're writing, stop you know take a break 
put it down and start the next day. That way you got something to build off of the next day and it help keep your juices flowing. And mm-hmm. that, that'll that help you get rid of the, or at least prevent the writer's block. So that would be number two. Ah, uh, number three. <laughs> I'm trying to think what number three would be. Oh, uh, probably what I've been learning. You know, one thing as an author, and I believe this is with any type of project, you always is you're always concerned about what others think about what you're doing. Because, like I said, when I did my first book, I went to, or when I f- first started writing my book. I went to my family and friends, coworkers to see what they thought about it. And that, if they all would have said, this all right, you know, I don't, I wouldn't actually sit back and read it, but you, you're not doing bad. Then I, I probably wouldn't have had these books now, you know, cause I would have been like, well, ain't nobody gonna read this book. So when you put out a book or, you know, get your literature out there, don't focus on what people are saying. Cause you're gonna always have naysayers. You're gonna always have people that say, I would never read this. You're going to have negative reviews. You know, you're going to have people saying this is horrible or they didn't tell the story correctly. But at the same time, you got a lot of people that love your work. So just because you got a few negative or you you could have majority negative reviews. And one of the reasons for that is because the people that love your book just aren't fans of writing reviews. (laughs) You know, they could enjoy your book and then just keep going. So I would say look past the naysayers and just keep doing what you love because you're going to reach. I believe there's an audience for anything you do. You know, whatever type of book you love to write, there's going to be people that love to read it. So don't don't look at the naysayers. Well, I agree with you 100% about that last one in particular because in business, you know, they say it's more likely that someone will file a complaint than to write a positive review. (laughs) Right, definitely. People who are unhappy with a business will tell on average eight people, whereas people who are happy will tell about three. Yeah, and that's true. You know, you notice that people feed off a negative, you know, not to speak bad about the majority, but you see that in just about every area is that negative is the, the fuel that keeps things going. So like you said, you're going to have people that speak negative about a hotel, a business, restaurant, before you see a lot of positive reviews. Well, now I'm just curious. So when you started writing, I don't, what what genre is it officially? Is it, does it fall into romance? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a combination of romance and drama. Yeah, so when you started writing kind of, uh, romance did your mom approve of your writing at that point (laughs) uh you know the interesting thing about my mother is that she's not a big book reader like like i said she's uh the hallmark lady (laughs) okay she watches the hallmark channel she's not a person that'll sit up and read read a book on a sunday evening you know or afternoon Mm -hmm. with nothing else to do so she she supports me but she's not quick to just sit back and read through a whole book (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I, I have to be honest about that one, yeah. But she wasn't horrified anymore that you were... No, no, uh, <laughs> no not at all. <laughs> That's the important thing. That's right, the important right. thing. We need moms to be happy. Yeah, definitely. Well, Nicholas, tell everybody where they can get your books and how they can connect with you online or, or do you have... I, I don't know if y'all are doing live events with um, everything going on right now. Yeah, well, I have been working with uh, Precious Brown. We've been doing a lot of live events. Like when I did the book release, we did a live interview on Facebook. So it's it's here and there. I'm trying to think, when do we have another one? I believe it's Labor Day. Labor okay. Day, me and Precious Brown will be doing another big event for book number six, White Collar Woman 6. And that'll be on Facebook. And we're also going to share the information with Instagram at the same time. And awesome. um Definitely for to get more information about the book, the website is the name whitecollarwoman.com. It's all one word, whitecollarwoman.com. And uh, you can get all the information on the books, the, the entire series. And at the same time, I was mentioning about the self help book. I also got a blog on there where it's like motivational blogs, you know, inspirational blogs. And, and it's kind of unique because, you know, the, the website is for a fiction series. 
but the the blogs on there is like motivational for people you know it gives you encouragement and it's kind of linked to the self-help book that's soon to come so definitely they can go to that whitecollarwoman.com you can see the books and you can also sign up for the blog if you need some inspiration definitely with the times we're dealing with now definitely and, definitely. and, and you can always go to amazon.com and find the entire series as well the white collar woman all right well nicholas mays thank you so much for appearing thank on somewhere in the middle with michelle barrard yes thank you so everyone has been going through quite a lot now with the pandemic with the economy with loss of jobs um, being worried in general, schools not opening, schools opening, well, and any number of other things. I can't even get into all the weird natural disaster things. <laughs> I mean, it really does seem like the earth is trying to shake us off. And because of that, I think it's really important that we spend some time thinking about how we can work through some of our anxiety and fear around these issues. So we are going to have a replay of a True Talk between Julia Black and me about dealing with stress and worry. Enjoy. All right, so we are back with Julia Black and True Talk. Hey, Julia. Hey, Michelle. Well, you and I, you know, we have all these conversations and this last one we were talking about, you know, different ways to deal with all of this um, worry, stress, anxiety, self-image, self-worth issues. And one of the things that we were talking about was, you know, kind of reprogramming our minds so that we don't spin out of control with all of these thoughts. What kind of experience have you had with that effort to reprogram the mind? Well, quite a bit, actually. Um, I, and we, we've talked about this before in some of my other interviews. I was that kid in school that was bullied, um, and then that kind of the self-esteem issues that led to that led to um, kind of an emotionally abusive relationship, not kind of, it was emotionally abusive relationship that I had in high school. And when all of that was said and done, I did pretty extensive therapy, and part of what we worked on was mindset stuff. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, discussion of my thinking and how I was viewing things that were happening and experiences I was having, having, uh, and part of that included, um, stopping for a minute and, and, and kind of making the realization, um, that I was viewing everything in a negative manner. So even things that had nothing to do with me as a person. So let's say, you know, somebody, you know, I'm at, I'm at the supermarket um, and, um, and a cart, like a, a rogue cart started rolling down the way and it ran into my car. I felt like the world was against me. Um, and there was a lot of that kind of thoughts and everything that was happening was negative and against me. Um, and so there was a, there was a lot of talk in therapy about how to change that. Um, so it was, you know, we talk about what, how I felt the most attacked for lack of a better word, because I wasn't physically attacked. It was just there, all of these things were happening, mm -hmm. uh, how I was feeling attacked. Um, and then other ways to look at it. So if we use that same example, if, you know, if a rogue shopping cart ran into my car, instead of saying, you know, oh, the universe is against me, it would be like, oh, these things happen. Was, was the car, was the car damaged? No, it wasn't damaged. There's no, there's no scratch. There's no nothing. It's fine. Let's just move the cart back where it should belong. Um, and kind of really making an effort with every single thing where I started to spin out of control and look at things negatively to stop for a second and see if there's another way to interpret the situation. Well, yeah, because a lot of times it's where maybe we're feeling some kind of way, you know, about something where you know, maybe something completely unrelated. And then we project that feeling onto so many other things or other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the problem with that, as I realized since then, because it took me, it literally took me years to break the habit um, but in retrospect, I look at it and go, gosh, it took so long. But once it happened, 
I'm like immediate once once I got used to the habit of looking at things positively or looking at other possibilities, all of a sudden everything changed. It didn't feel like the world was against me. I could see everything that was really good in my life. Um, and and so it was so it changed the energy so that things actually so that good things actually did start happening. Well, that goes with that concept of, you know, you get what you expect, right? Yeah. You know, kind of a law of attraction type thing where basically the things that come into your life are coming because you are vibrating at that level for whatever reason. And so the cart coming and hitting the car may not have been something that you were actively thinking, but on some level you were anticipating something possibly happening to the car, maybe. You know what I mean? Right. Like that kind of energy was somehow put into, you know, out into the universe and it, that's how it manifested. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing, you know, for me, I would, <laughs> I remember at one point, I had a very interesting experience. I had come back from living in Latin America and we had rented the house and the lady who was living in the house did not want to move. I, I knew she did not want to move. And I was like, well, I need my house back because I'm back. <laughs> and right. So, you know, so you got to move, right? But do you know that every time I would think to myself, oh, I need to make sure that I call her and remind her of this having to do with the move. Or every time I think, oh, well, we've got to do that having to do with the move something would happen that would completely take me off my game and distract me from the fact that I want, I needed something to happen with regard to this move. It was the weirdest thing. And I remember noticing that at some point going, what is going on with me? Cause literally one time I was driving, you know, you just think random thoughts while you're driving. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, when I get home, I've got to say this to her about the move. And I literally, it's like my car jumped. It felt like, and hit a curb and busted my tire at that point. Wow. Yeah, it was really, it was really weird. And that's when I'm like, oh my goodness, what's going on with me that made that happen was when I started thinking like, what is going on that every time I think about the fact, and I was like, maybe I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not ready to handle another move, you know, or something like that. There right. had to be something going on. And sometimes we do see those very clear indications that there's something going on with us. But most of the time, we don't realize, I think, that yeah. we are thinking in a weird way um, or interpreting situations in some kind of weird way. Mm -hmm. how did, so how did you first become aware that you had these kind of negative thoughts swirling around and they were maybe causing things to operate a certain kind of way in your world? Well, it started, well, it started with... with, with with anxiety, to be honest, start with anxiety, but I was no, so, so there was a lot of talk, um, and there was a lot of stuff, there was a lot of talk in therapy, and a lot of stuff that I was doing actively to make it so that I didn't kind of go down the rabbit hole, right, so when you're anxious, you start to get, um, you start to kind of worry about one thing, and that, and it ends up snowballing, so you worry about one thing, and then you start spinning about it, and it's like, oh, and that can lead to this, and that, you know, and what happens if this happens, then it's really going to be bad, and then this other thing can happen, and then it's really going to be bad, and you just kind of start spinning out of control, so there was a lot of talk about things to do to stop that, and those things included distracting myself. Um, that was a big one, Mm -hmm. um, is that because my mind was so overactive, if I could find a way to stop my mind from going on those tracks, um, that was, that helped immensely. So we made a list of, um, kind of self-care things to do, but we also made a list of ways that I can distract my brain when I start to spin out of control because, because it was hard, because it was hard for me to stop the thoughts once they started. So if I could distract my brain, it was going to be easier. So for me, because I always really liked reading, um, you know, it was, I always picked up a novel. So when everything's got really bad, I just kind of made sure that all of my kind of main stuff was done. And then I just started reading. And then when I got to a point where I was 
calm enough, then I could stop and really think through it and start working on positive affirmations, which is another thing that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at, you know, other possible other possible reasons why things would be happening. And then once that happened, then all of a sudden everything, once I was able to get the anxiety under control, then I was able to apply it to the times and the other kind of situations where I wasn't anxious. Um, you know, just, you know, randomly getting, um, randomly getting a flat tire or, you know, whatever, whatever other things were happening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, what kinds of things do you think people should think about doing to combat this kind of, you know, mental spinning out of control? Stop. Do whatever you can to stop. Don't let, you know, don't let yourself, don't start doing Google searches. I mean, when, when all of this was happening, I wasn't, the internet had just kind of come out and I wasn't really adept at it. So I didn't have... I had no way, re I, well, I could have, but I wasn't going to go to the library and start searching through medical books or whatever. But when I start to get anxious about something, don't, don't go down the, don't, do not go down the Google rabbit hole. Just don't, <laughs> just don't because it's just going to, it's just going to make it worse. It never, it never makes it better when you're anxious. It never makes it better. And part of the reason why is because, you know, like, let's talk about you being sick, right? So you could talk about, you could, you could type in symptoms. And because you're anxious already, you're not even going to acknowledge the one that's like you possibly have a cold. You're immediately going to go to the one that's, that's, you know, terminal cancer. Right. <laughs> Everything is a symptom of terminal cancer, by exactly. the way. Exactly. If anybody's been on, on WebMD, you should know that it doesn't matter what you look up. Somehow they're going to bring it around to you might have cancer. Yes. So, so don't, just don't do that. Yes. You know, for the love of everything good, do not, do not go down the Google rabbit hole, whatever that is. Absolutely don't do that. But definitely distract yourself. Find a way, um, find a way to get your brain off of it. You know, call a friend and go have dinner. Um, and being with people generally helps because it gets you out of your head. Yeah. So call a friend, go have dinner. If it's too late, if you, you know, wake up at two or three in the morning and your brain is spinning and you're anxious about something, then pull out a book or watch a movie or, you know, meditate, meditate, meditation in the end. Once I started meditating, it pretty much solved everything. It was the hardest, it was the hardest thing for me to do. As somebody whose brain never, ever, ever stops, the hardest thing for me to do was meditate mm -hmm. um, every day. I did, it, I, did a, I did it at least once a day, but I tried for twice a day and did it for 20 minutes. Um, and I did it religiously for six months. Um, and then, and it was the hardest 20 minutes of my whole day. Um, but eventually it got to the point where it made it so that I could control my thoughts. Um, and that was important. So, you know, and everybody's going to have a different way, you know, and starting and starting with now looking at it, starting with 20 minutes when you have a mind that races is probably not the best thing to do. Um, I would suggest doing, you know, right now when I suggest people meditate, I suggest they start with a walking meditation or a guided meditation. Um, or if they want to try and keep their mind blank, start with a five minute meditation. Um, but it will absolutely help. It will absolutely help. Well, and I would imagine that also reframing is yes. what, what you were talking about earlier. Are there other ways that you could perceive this situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you, and, and, and the easiest way is to just go, okay, think about your most logical, down to earth, normal, calm person, the kind of person that doesn't get like super upset over things, the kind of person that just kind of lets everything roll off their back. Ask yourself how that person would view the situation. And then, and, or, or, and take, and take a few different people, right? So, okay, if you have a friend that's super upbeat and super happy about everything, how would that person view the situation? How would this person view the situation? And take a look at, um, take a look at those things and then figure out which one you think is the best answer. 
Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So guys, we've got a few things that you can do. If you find your brain just spinning out of control with anxiety, with worry, with self-image issues, self-worth issues, you're not good enough, you're, whatever those thoughts are, uh, or even heaven forbid, I'm sick, there's something wrong with me, what have you. We're not saying don't look into it, but don't go down the rabbit hole, especially the internet rabbit hole. Uh, all kinds of crazy can come out of that. <laughs> just, yeah. We want to combat the crazy. Yeah. We yes. want to tamp down on the crazy. Don't go into the Google crazy hole. Yeah, don't go down. Just don't, you know, and doctors will tell you not to Google stuff. They just, you know, they will. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if you're sick, then talk to a doctor or talk to an acupuncturist or talk to somebody that 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 is more knowledgeable about these things and has a lot more experience with these things than you do. Um, Cause that will, that will help. Well, and you guys want to make sure that you meditate. And I like to mention this because I think a lot of people think, Oh, meditate. I've got to sit there and go, um, and that's not what some people are into. Uh, Joe, you gave some great suggestions about walking meditations and stuff like that, or just taking a walk in nature mm -hmm. and meditation. But I want to remind people that prayer is a form of mm -hmm. meditation. People forget that, especially in, um, Today's society, the way that, it, sorry, Christian folks, some of y'all go nutty <laughs> over the concept of meditation. Like, God doesn't want us to clear our minds. Y'all don't know what God wants anyway. Um, <laughs> you read are written by people who are interpreting what they think God wants. You don't know. So my thing is, don't get so hung up on that word. Yeah. What you're really trying to do is calm your energy and calm your spirit. Prayer is a form of meditation. I know this. I grew up Catholic. Believe me, I know yeah. that it can be highly meditative to pray, to just sit down and have that quiet time with spirit. Yeah. And, and there are other, yeah. And there are other, and, and different Christian denominations have different ways of quote meditating, right? So right. there's just sitting quietly and praying, you know, if you're Catholic doing the rosary, that's a form of meditation. Um, if um, there's a lot of like some of the more pro the Protestant denominations or the evangelical ones, any, any Bible verse, any really kind of encouraging Bible verse that you can repeat in your head that you've memorized, that's going to help. Um, the Quakers, what I always like, what I always like telling my Christian friends about meditation when they start to get um, a little angsty about it is that the Quakers meditated. Um, and what they did is um, they the statement was, Lord, have mercy on me. And they essentially would say it with every inhale and every exhale. So you inhale and say, Lord, you exhale and say, have, you inhale and say, mercy on me. You do that and you just keep doing it and you focus on your breathing and you do it with every breath. Hmm. Um, and that's, and that was you know, and the Quakers were actually incredibly meditative because they, because even like the way that their services were, um, you know, where, where people could just kind of speak up the way that their, it, the way that their weddings were, where there, there really wasn't a facilitator. There was a person up front and the couple stood up front and everybody in the, and everybody that was there could speak up and say one thing that they thought was, you know, God was putting on their heart to state. But after, you know, a certain amount, everyone just kind of sat there, sits there quietly. Everyone sits there quietly and, and tries to commune with God. And they speak when they feel led to speak. And at the end, the couple is declared married. <laughs> well, and that's, that's, that's really, well, first of all, who knew the Quakers were so cool? I know, but, really? <laughs> but on top of that, the point of it being really, don't freak out over the word meditation. Yeah. Prayer is a form of meditation, so you don't have to freak out about it. The main point is to calm the mind and the spirit and to commune with spirit. Yes. And lastly, don't forget that there are other ways that you can look at almost any situation. We're not saying that the way you're looking at it is wrong or bad. We're saying, though, that maybe there's another way to look at it so that it could be more productive for you, so that it's less destructive to your mind and, and spirit and your energy and that you can feel better about yourself and that situation. Yes. I think that's, that's 
good stuff. What do you think, Julia? I think so too. And I think for the most part, the other thing that I think is really important with this, which we can have a whole separate shoe talk about it, but realize what your own worth is. Yes. Because, um, you know, the negative stuff that we have, um, the negative stuff that goes on in our brains, particularly if, if we think that the world is against us, has to do with us not recognizing our own worth and our own path and the fact that we were he that we're here for a purpose, we have a purpose, and there's a very specific way that you that each person can change the world. And well, and I'm going to add one more thing in there. Mm -hmm. When you focus on these things like everything or everybody's out to get you, you're giving other folks a whole lot of power. Yeah, that is true. And that's part of your concept of self-worth as well. Don't give away your power. People can only do to you what you allow them to do. And a lot of that is mental. It's not saying that you're doing something wrong. If somebody comes and punches you in the eye, they did that. They were, they did something wrong. Okay. So we're not saying that they did not do something wrong, but we're saying how you feel about it and how you respond to it is all you. Yes. And you can either respond to it saying this person is, you know, you know, hurting me and they are, you know, they're somehow um, stronger and more powerful than me. Or you can say, you know what, I have the right as a strong and powerful person to not deal with this kind of crazy and I ain't dealing with it anymore. Okay, person who punched me and I stay out of my way. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of ways you can handle it. There's probably more, but that's just two. Yeah. So yeah. guys, don't forget you want to not go down that rabbit hole. Please, don't, especially not the Google rabbit hole, but don't go down that emotional rabbit hole. Make sure you get some quiet time and meditate, pray, whatever it is that you need to do to settle your spirit and reframe what you can reframe. Mm -hmm. Julia, thank you so much for being on True Talk. Thanks for having me. Well, that's our show this week, guys. You can reach out to me online at urbanbookeditor.com or michellebarard.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram as Urban Book Editor. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send in some topics you'd like us to cover on the show. Make sure you guys tune in for the show on September 11th when my guest will be author B.G. Howard. You can find us twice a month on Fridays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern Time at the somewhere in the middle podcast.com. Let's continue the conversation. You guys be good, stay mindful, and remain prayerful. Peace and blessings, y'all. <laughs>